We want to thank you for joining us at Cowboy Junction Church today. As you hear this message, we pray that your faith will grow and you'll be both encouraged and challenged. If you enjoy what's happening at Cowboy Junction, it would really help us out if you would subscribe, rate, review, and share this online. You can also help us reach others by partnering with us financially. You can easily give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift at cowboyjunctionchurch.com slash give. We hope you enjoy this message. Okay, so for everybody in this place and you're like, you're sitting here today and you know, I don't know how I got to this place today. They promised me roses and I'm going to hold them to it. They said, hey, go to church with us. We'll take you to roses. Perfect. That sounds like a good deal. So you and me, we need to work out a deal. I'll preach shorter if you listen longer. Does that make sense? Okay. So like even if you're in the room, I got, you, you would say, I got nothing to do with God. Okay. But you know what a good deal sounds like, right? So I'll preach short, you listen long, and maybe, here's my prayer, you're at the end of it's going to go, you know, I don't remember anything that guy said, but I just felt like I began to ask the question, why, was, why, why don't I trust God more? And what you're going to pay attention to today on is a bunch of believers who are just literally following their father, and we're going to have a question, we're going to have this question come up about how can we move from being safe praying people to scary step out in faith praying people okay and i hope by the end of it you would go i mean i i i applaud those folks they talked about some scary stuff today and they all took it like a grain of salt that was pretty cool okay so so hang on to the conversation at the end of today i'm going to ask you a very important question what if you began to refer to as the god of the universe as someone you'd be willing to follow, okay, and his plan for your life. Okay, so with it, we're going to learn Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, what would be considered the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, it says that they turned uh, to Jesus, therefore, uh, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, and stop right there. The reason why I want to bring this up is because this is when Jesus turned to a group of people asking, how should we be talking to God? And Jesus gave them a great answer. He said this, and let's all read it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. I was very young when I memorized it. Over the years, it has directed my prayer life a lot. But can I be very honest with you in that as instructional as this prayer is, it also teach, taught me how to pray very safely. Okay? And let me give you an idea on what a safe prayer looked like in praying exactly what Jesus asked us to pray. This is me. This may not be you. It was me being honest, and it was me waking up in the morning, having a bowl of cereal, hopping into my truck, turning off the radio for just all of 15 seconds for me to go, oh, my Father is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be. You jerk, what are you doing? You gotta slow down. Oh, okay, here we go. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses. I forgive those who trespass against me. Ooh, McDonald's is having half off on Mc, Mc, McFlurries. That's going to be great. Good stuff. Okay. Our uh, Father's heart in heaven, I'll be the name of the kingdom come that will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive me my trespasses. I forgive those who trespass against me. Lead me not to temptation. Deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I love you, Lord. You're awesome. How was that? And there was nothing absolutely wrong with that at all. It was something that I can just tell you that that prayer has directed and guided my life for all of my life. But in as instructional as it is from the, the Son of God himself, Jesus, it can turn into a very, very safe prayer. Okay, so everybody look up here. That's what we've been talking about. Getting away from safe prayers. And praying pivotal prayers. And what has been our definition of a pivotal prayer? 
It's someone who's going a certain direction in their life, okay? You could be going a certain direction in your life too. But then all of a sudden, God challenges you to quit praying safe, comfortable prayers. And to start praying prayers of faith and dependency and scary and dangerous prayers that all of a sudden you start thinking, oh man, it's going to get, oh God, you really get, I trust you. And something pivotal happens to where you go a completely different direction, the direction you're going. And you'll always come back to that moment and realize that was the day that I quit praying safe prayers. And I started praying scary, serious, God, I need you, dangerous, pivotal prayers. This is a dangerous prayer. And some people would say, I, I've got that memorized. I say it every morning. But do you let it penetrate your heart? And that's what today's about. Not to pray this prayer for convenience. But can you look at the words of this prayer from the words of Jesus himself that challenges us to get down to really seeing what the heart of this prayer is? Okay? So let's examine it. You guys ready? Here we go. In Matthew chapter 6, at the very beginning, verse 9, it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is it talking about here? It's talking about worship. Worship being the key focus here. Now, we just came out of worship. And one of the dangerous things about if I was to ask you, what is worship? Some of us wouldn't even know how to answer that question. What is worship? Some of us would say, well, it's singing. Some of us would say, well, it's a time about 15 minutes before the pastor preaches and we sing three songs and we all sit down. It's the t Some of us would say worship is the time at church where we allow the peop people who didn't set their clocks right to come in late to church so that we all start at the same time with the message. And, and the fact is, you've got to stop. What is worship? To give you an idea of what this is, I I'm going to be quick today. Everybody watching online, distract all those distractions that may be in your house, just kind of tune them out. Go to another room. Go driving. Go do something. And the real essence of everything we're going to get today, if we're going to get to the point to where our faith grows, you have to understand worship. And to understand what worship is, I want you to understand first and foremost, there is always a competition for your worship in life. There is always fight some, there's always something fighting for your worship in the world you live in. There is always something asking you to put it before anything else. You may have never been taught this your whole life, but let me teach you something real quick. In your life, there is a number one spot. It holds one seat. Only one thing can sit in it, and it is the number one thing in your life. And your life was entirely made to worship whatever sits in that seat. And you get the choice of putting whatever it is you want to put in that number one spot. But here's something out of your control. You ready? Everything is battling for that spot. Let me give you some examples. Your spouse, in all the sweetness that he is or she is, will always demand your number one attention. And that can be the number one strain on every marriage. Heather wants to hold the number one spot. I want to be the number one spot in her life. And you know what the problem with it is? God did not build her to fulfill all of my needs. And I'm putting a pressure on her she'll never be able to do. And our marriage crumbles because I think there's a flaw in her. Our marriage crumbles because she thinks that, well, I knew I shouldn't have married him. He's just messed up. I need to leave him, go find a guy, that the perfect guy, the guy that my mom said I should have married. And that doesn't exist. Because there's nobody in the world that has that kind of ability to hold the number one spot. Do you realize that a marriage works where two people seek God with their whole heart and come together, and God makes two one when we seek God with all of our heart? Here's another idea. You know who's demanding your attention all the time, parents? Your stinking kids. 
right? Is it true? And kids, you got to realize we use stinking in the Greek terminology, which means sweet and wonderful and incredible <laughs> and awesome and beautiful. Oh my gosh. So, so the Greek Hebrew version of stinking is this, oh, it's just, you're just so stinking cute. You're so, right, parents? Yeah. Right, yeah, uh-huh. And, and, and their kids demand to be the number one spot. Number one thing, ah, why can't I have it? Ah, I don't want to. And it's, uh, that's for the other kids, not the, not the stinking kids in this room, huh? <laughs> right. And kids, you got to realize your immaturity is a sign that you want to you sit in, num- in the number one spot. And God didn't call you to sit in the number one spot. Amen. That's one of the hardest things to re- figure out in life. And you're going to figure out where you are in life when you finally figure out, kids, listen to this, who sits in the number one spot in your life. There is a constant, and I use this word seriously, battle for your worship. And whatever you worship is the very thing that controls everything else in your life. This is where we talk about it at church. We don't, it's funny. We, you never find yourself in these conversations outside of church. And the reason why is because God turns to every one of us and says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And so the first thing that we bring up is do you have the ability to stop and have the pivotal moment of realizing that you have made the conscious decision of giving your worship, your rightful worship, to the God who created you. And the trickle-down effect from that number one spot trickles down into every other area of your life, and we call that his blessings. But it takes the moment that your worship comes alive. Let me just tell you, we weren't taught to worship. You have the ability to worship, but worship is one of those things that sometimes we think... I don't know how to worship. We're not talking about singing today, folks. We're not talk, talking about getting the words right. We're not talking about playing an instrument. We're not talking about sitting here. I'm really asking you, have you stopped and asked the dangerous question, God, do I worship you well? And the reason why we don't ever ask that question is because sometimes we already know the answer. It's funny, sometimes I, I, I come to church, we come to church, and in an hour and 15 minutes of being here, we've allowed him to come back to the number one spot, but we, now we've got to go back into the world and live a six and a half day week and try to rebound every hour and 15 minutes on Sunday. And what if I turned to you right now and asked you this question, why doesn't worship become the daily existence of your life to keep God in the number one spot, to fight for that worship, to eliminate everything else, to fight to make sure God stays at that number one spot because you realize this, from him all good things come. A few things in this prayer, you'll notice that Jesus starts off by saying two words. He says, our Father. Everybody say, our Father. And until you know God as your Father, you will never be able to worship him the way that you will can know worship. Let me give you an idea. Some of you think that worshiping God is a religious thing. And if it was a religious thing, it would actually draw us away from God because religion is one of the biggest sins, is when we, we, we think we can work for God's approval. That's not it. What worship is is thankfulness for something we couldn't do, but only God can. And when you finally see him as a father, then you're able to throw your hands up, throw your heart up, throw your intentions up, throw your minds up, throw everything up and say, God, I, I, I worship you. I want to thank you for never giving up on me. I want to thank you, Father, for always being my Lord. I want to turn to you and just let you know that, that I, I, uh, I, I put you in the number one spot in my life. And this is that worship. And for a lot of us here, and, I, and I'm just going to capitalize this in a, just a little bit. Some of you didn't have good fathers growing up. Some of, some of you just didn't have good fathers. They, they, it's hard for you to relate what God is like as a father because you keep relating to what your father was like and you don't see how this works. And, and, and can I just tell you real quick that 
there's this moment I think you need to stop and realize that it's a scary prayer. For some of you, it terrifies you to actually turn to God the Father and say, I want you to be my father. I want you to show me like a father shows a son. I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. Show me how to live. And that scares some of you. It makes you have a panic attack because you're doing just fine not having anybody in your life. And I'm going to tell you, you're in a lonely place that God never intended you to be. And that's why this is a pivotal prayer. Because you thought you were doing good and everything was great. I'm, I'm, I'm living a good life. I'm living a great life. But we're not talking about that kind of living. We're talking about a pivotal moment that changes your life forever. And it comes from the moment you really recognize that God is your Father. And He loves you immensely. That our worship isn't a distraction worship. It isn't a more. Give me more. Give me more. This is a worship where you just sit back and you're just grateful. And you are... Your, your complete dependency is on him. I've started off many a prayer time where I just turn to him and say, I just want to start this morning and say good morning. Because there was a, the morning I used to wake up every morning and say, good Lord morning instead of good morning Lord. And I just want to turn to you and say, my complete dependency is on you. And let me just tell you, when you fight for that number one spot for God to hold it, you watch how it flows into every other area of your life. But I will make you a promise. There's something right now fighting for your worship. It says, Hollywood be your name. You know what this Hollywood means? It means holy. You are holy, God. You're beyond anything I can imagine or think. You, right now, you're in charge of things I don't even know about. And me coming to you and putting you on that number one spot is actually aligning the universe in favor of everything you want to do in my life. And so I want to stop this morning, and I want to just turn to you and say, you got it. It's yours, the number one spot. It's scary. But let me tell you what, guys. It's pivotal for you to ever be the people God wants you to be. Second thing that happens, it says in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is, is, is in heaven. This is a powerful revelation moment and let me explain revelation it's an aha aha moment i mean let me tell you how big an aha moment was as a kid growing up i was always told god wants to talk to you god wants you to come with your needs god wants you to come to him and so when i was a kid i would just show up and i would have my list and it would be my genie in the bottle i'm not going to attempt the song okay i'm not going to attempt the song it's just ugly because then hip music hip movement comes and it's just not right okay and so God would be my genie in a bottle. And as a kid, I was just like, this is how you're supposed to pray. This is how you're supposed to pray. But one day I was praying, and I had just got through praying the Lord's Prayer. And I was quickened by the Holy Spirit, just, just him saying, hey, go back and listen to what you prayed. And I would go back, and I just got through saying, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the and, and Holy Spirit said, say it again. God, your kingdom come. Your... And it dawned on me. This is a moment to one of the scariest parts about this prayer is that it turns to us and says, we don't want your list right now. I don't, I don't want your list right now. Can you pray, God, I trust you enough to declare, I want your best. May your kingdom come. May everything you want to do, everything you want to say, everything you want to do, Everything you want to just erase, flush out, reconstruct, change the way I speak, change the way I think, change the places I go. May your kingdom come. That means let's expand it. Let's grow it. Let's see what it looks like when the whole world turns into your kingdom. We can worry about my list later. But I'm really worried about my list because there's some important things on that list. But it's taking some great faith to not bring up the list right now because I know may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's dangerous because it's praying what God wants for my life before I start telling God what I want for my life. I mean, to all the single people in the room, that's a whole other song I'm not going to sing either, okay? <laughs> all the single ladies, listen to me. All the single ladies, it's easy for you to go to God and say, oh, look, God, I want that, him to be it. I want him to be the one. God, please let him be the one. Let him be the one. 
That's the easiest, safest prayer to pray in the world. To spend the rest of your life every month coming to a new, but no, 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 forget the last one. This one, Lord, this one. Let him be the one. And I'm going to just turn to you and say, a scary prayer. What if you never prayed for your husband again? <laughs> man, 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 same thing. And, and, and listen, you may be married in the room going, you, you, you single girls need to listen. Oh, quit it. We all got little things we're praying for. And what if you never asked for it again? And you just simply had the courageous, scary faith to say, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I can be lonely. Let me say it like this. I can be alone for the rest of my life if that's your will for my life. I can be married for the rest of my life if that's your will for my life. God, I can be patient for the rest of my life if that's your will for my life. Because I pray that your kingdom come and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when you start praying for God's kingdom to happen, you'll be surprised how you look over and there was your list. I have kept a prayer journal for several years now. And in the prayer journal, I went back and began to read some of the things I was praying for two years ago. It's embarrassing to see the things that I used to pray about that were such a big deal back then. And I was able to, I wrote it down just to clear my thoughts. And then I would close it and pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And God would just do his thing in me. And I would look back over my prayers and go, man, I'm glad I prayed God's kingdom come. Because I was so wrapped up in things that I had no clue that God wasn't talking to me about because in just a couple of hours, those things wouldn't matter anymore. Is this making sense? It takes some courage to set your list aside to say your kingdom come and your will be done. The next thing it says, give us this day our daily bread, which proves that Jesus says, now let's bring up your list. But let's bring up the things that after praying God's kingdom really begin to make sense now. And there are some things in your life right now you know are essential and important to your existence. Maybe it's your bills. Maybe it's your job. Perhaps it's your kids. But do you know that in your life there is a daily diet of sustenance that we have to stop and realize this is your diet? And this diet takes place in two things, a provisional diet and a spiritual diet. First one, provisional diet. At some point, instead of us just turning to God and saying, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me, and then you going out and making things work, there has to be a maturity take place in your life to realize we don't have anything that God doesn't give us. He is your provider. Okay, real quick, everybody look up here. You're going to go through three seasons in your life when it comes to finally figuring out that God is the giver of all things you need. And then I'm going to give you a story, okay? The first one is this. You're going to be in the learning stage. When you finally move from, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it, I just need to work harder. I just need to do bigger things. And going back and realizing there's nothing wrong with working harder, thinking bigger, coming up with great ideas. But if it's all about you, you make no room for what God wants to do in you. God, you are the only one who can give me this day my daily bread. And the first stage is this, and is the learning stage. Second stage is this, is the faith stage. Okay? What I mean by the faith stage, some of you through the last four, eight, 12 weeks have lost your job. Things have gotten tough. You're wondering if you're going to keep your job. And I want to turn to you right now, and I want to make a declaration you need to just have in your home. If the world turns against us, it doesn't mean that God has stopped being for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Which, let me tell you, in the rodeo world, let me just tell you how this works. It's CG's dad rodeos. We have a lot of friends at rodeo. Um, with me being a rodeo pastor over the years... What do you do when you go through a dry spell? 
when all winter long, all spring long, you were killing it and killing it. Then the summer rolls along and you just, you draw bad and your steers run slow or they run too fast. Or, or we've got Luke Creasy who goes to our church as a bareback rider. He drove all the way to Cave Creek, Arizona, rider a bareback horse, scored 77, well, incredible score. Didn't even place, came all the way back home with no paycheck, but he had to go there to try that horse. What do you do when you're in a slump? Sometimes you can think God is against you. Has anybody ever thought God was against you? Nobody's nodding because everybody's scared to nod. But it's like, yeah, I drive all the way to Arizona. All they got to do is just give me two more points and make me a 79. Paid $5,000, but I missed the cut. But Luke has something, and it's something I've taught a lot of people. Do you not think God can provide for you past a bucking horse? Do you not think that God can provide for you past your job? And if you lost everything tomorrow, do you not think that God himself can give you the creativity to step past your uncomfortableness into the peace of God that passes all understanding and says, you're my provider. You will show me what to do. You will make a way where there seems to be no way. God, you are my provider. Give me this day my daily bread. And the next thing you know, God's showing you how to do something cool. And you know what that's called? The faith stage. Let me tell you now the story. You guys ready for a story? There was an old man who taught me this lesson many years ago. His name was Mike. He built radio towers. If you've heard me preach long, you've heard me talk about Mike many a time. Had the privilege of being a young uh, high school, college-age kid who would come home for the weekend and jump in the truck with Mike, and we'd drive all over the place. Mike would build radio towers, and from time to time, Mike would fall into the situation a lot of construction guys fell into is that something was bound to go wrong. Has anybody ever started a project, you knew God was for you, and then the next thing, everything screwed up? Yeah. Just, 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 and now you find the project was going to cost more money than you bid it, okay? This was a part of construction. Now, I had been brought up around men who were in construction. Mike wasn't one of them, but they had taught me how to do the things that fix stuff, like cussing. You got to be a good cusser if you're going to be in the contract business, okay? And I don't mean these sissy little sissy words. I mean the big F bomb, the big <laughs> people knew you were serious. Uh, the other day I heard a joke about the preacher who uh, bought a lawnmower from a guy, and he sat back there and he tried to start it and tried to start it and tried to start it. A little boy walked up and he said, hey, you got to cuss at it. And the preacher said, I am not going to cuss at that. He goes, it worked for the guy who sold you the lawnmower. He says, young man, I am not going to cuss at this. And he's pulling on it and pulling on it. And the, and the young man said, well, keep pulling on it. It'll come back to you. And uh, did I mess that joke up? Yeah, so anyway. Uh, yeah, and some of you are like, I've been pulling on this thing forever. And just, cussing works. Let me stop. I've been around those guys. And just, let's, just, let's get angry. Let's just get angry. Let's blame everybody else for this mistake and not... Realize it wasn't anybody's fault. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't his fault. But the, I, I was around those guys who could cuss and then bust in the door and blame everybody else. Well, it had to be your fault. If you, people would get off your butts and quit taking the week, weekend off. And who's going to pick this up? And blaming everybody. I'm like, people are afraid to move right now because I'm totally describing you. Okay? <laughs> okay? It, it could be, let's throw things. Has anybody been around a thrower? Which like, let's just pick up the whole screwdriver tray and throw it across the shop. And let's pick up the, the, the socket wrenches and just sockets are flying all over the place. Let's prove a point. Let's cuss, let's blame everybody else, and let's throw sockets all over the shop. That'll make things better. And then there was Mike. So I'm in the truck with Mike, and he just lost a ton of money. We're talking about $100,000, $200,000 in a phone call. Okay, and your breath kind of is taken away. I mean, that's that's two hundred thousand dollars. I never forget. Remember back when Maranatha used to come out with cassettes, the Mar Maranatha praise and worship, and Mike would turn to me and he'd go, "Hey, you're with me today. We're going to go tr for a drive, but I, I just want you to sit there." And I would respectfully just sit there. I said, "Yes, sir." I could see the stress come all over him. We all experience stress. And Mike would pop that Maranatha tape in, and it would just begin to sing praises to the Lord. Come on, everybody. And, it, and I mean, it was just, that was Amy Grant that was, they did Maranatha, and, 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 and just, she would just begin to praise the Lord. 
and he would close his eyes and he would just let the worship penetrate his truck. And he'd drive out in the middle of nowhere where no one could find him. And he would just praise the Lord and praise the Lord. And then after his heart was right and stress and worry was gone, he would be, begin to declare, Father, give me this day my daily bread. Father, give me this day my daily bread. Father, today I come to you and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Father, you are my provider. You go before me. You are my rear guard. Uh, 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 blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of God, or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the, in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law he will meditate day and night and he'll be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water which yields its fruit in season. Father, I come to you and you are my provider. You are my great provider. And he would just begin to confess these things. I watched it. I watched it with my own eye. But the $200 hadn't been made up yet. $200,000 hadn't been made up yet. And I would just sit there as Mike would begin to cry out, I'm not going to worry. This is you, God. You are my provider. And then the phone rang. I was sitting right there when the phone rang. And he reached down into the box and pulled out the phone. Huh? You're following me? All right, all right. And he put the phone up and he says, hello. Man, that's awesome. And on the other end was the, was the man, the company who sold him his tower parts. Okay? Mr. Rogers, we just want to thank you. That's a salesman, basically. No one likes salesman phone calls. And for all the salesmen in the room, we love your phone calls. Okay. You, you, you're, you're selling stuff. You're selling stuff. Mike owes $200,000. You don't want a salesman phone call. Does this make sense? Don't get bored with this story. Hold on. Mike is now talking to the salesman, and the salesman says, Hey, Mike, I just want to let you know that um, we appreciate your business. And the thing that we love about you the most is when most people get our bills, you pay them off three months, or, or they, other people, pay them off three months later. That's kind of the way the oil field works. You get a bill, you pay it off three months later. We love you, Mike, because you get a bill, and within a week, we get the check. You get a bill, within a week, we get the check. And so our company just called to let you know, we are going to offer you a 40% discount for the whole year. And uh, we just we want to say thank you. And Mike goes, I never forget, he goes, that's great, 40%. So what do I do? Do I just kind of like, like order stuff, and we'll apply it later? Okay, cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Hangs up. He's like, ah, oh, jeez. Lord, come on. Lord, we need you. We need you, Father. Oh, 200000 Father, show me what to... And Mike began right there. It just dawned on him. Last year, he did $8 million with a business with this company. 40% of $8 million means that he can buy equipment at a 40% discount, charge the same amount when he's building a tower... And now he's making 40% off of whatever he was making to build towers. What's 40% of $8 million? Anybody know? It's a lot of money. <laughs> and instantly, he saw how this year was going to be the biggest year of his entire life. And that year, he bought more radio tower equipment than he'd ever bought before because business went up and he had a 40% discount. And I sat in his truck and watched this. And I'm telling you, when you realize you can't work your way out of some of the things we find ourselves getting into, but you don't have to, your father, if you would turn to him and trust him, is the provider for his people. I will go before you. I will be your rear guard. I will be the shepherd who leads you in paths, uh, in, in, in the, the fields and the, and, the, and the streams. I will be your shepherd, but you have to declare him as your provider. It's also a spiritual diet. When are we finally going to get hungry for God? When are you finally going to get hungry for getting up in the morning and going before him and giving him the number one spot if you can't read your Bible, listen to your Bible. If you have no way of listening to your Bible, some of the men, you know what sometimes we need to do? Is take our Bible, give it to our wife. Okay, see, so she's not my wife, but pretend she's my wife. And give it to your wife and say, pick a spot. And she goes, okay, you're going to start right here. And you take it back, and it's where you start. And it's something to where at least 
You are devouring the spiritual bread that God has for you that day and to get hungry for who God is. It's your diet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move quick. Are you guys, you guys ready to move quick? Okay. Right, everybody hold on. Everybody grab the side of your chair. Okay. Hold on. Here we go. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You're not going to like this one. <clears throat> There's a point in every day to where we must depend on God's forgiveness, not assume on God's forgiveness. And when we assume, oh, God's, God's forgiven me. God's got it. Stop. There is a discipleship that God wants to do in your heart. And if we pray safe prayers, it's like, God, forgive me of my sins. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And in three seconds, it does not compare to the life change of God truly coming to us and allowing a, a, a heart transplant. Several weeks ago, we looked at a prayer David prayed when he said, search me, O God, and try my anxieties, try my heart, see if there's any wicked way about me, and then, Father, lead me into your paths everlasting. When do we allow God to not only forgive us of our sins, but examine our heart for life change so that we can sin no more. There are two types of sins you have in your life. There is the sin of commission and the sin of omission. The sin of commission is when you know what you're supposed to do and you do something completely different. You know the right thing to do and you do the complete opposite thing. Those, you have to go before the Lord and say, I am sorry, but will you do something? Will you examine my heart and show me why I'm this way? And it's scary to pray that because you may just show me something that I really would like to just kind of keep in the dark parts of my life. But to pray a safe prayer, Father, forgive me of my sins. Thanks, Lord. But to pray a scary prayer, a dangerous prayer, a pivotal prayer, God, show me the deeper reason of why this is happening all the time. And the sin of omission, to where there are sins that we are doing that we don't even know we're doing. And if you would stop and say, I know they're there, God would begin to show you things that you didn't even know was causing the division between you and him. And he's not going to do it to embarrass you or hurt you. But it's a gentle tap on the shoulder saying, when you do this, what do you think comes out of it? I never thought about it. We need to talk about it, don't we? And that takes courage. Forgiveness is everything. It's not just asking for forgiveness. It's now extending forgiveness. Folks, real quick. One of the healthiest things you'll ever pray is, God, now that you've done this work in me, show me how to extend it to everybody else. Keep going and we're done. I have the worship team come up. Verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is spiritual warfare all around you. And in verse 13, it says, Lord, lead us not into temptation. The first thing I want you to get, God leads well. Did you hear me? Say it back to me. God leads well. But you're going to have to turn into that child that is willing to hold on to your daddy's hand to allow him to lead you. Does that sound corny? Absolutely. It's meant to. Because some of you aren't being good at being God's kid. It's not that you don't trust God. It's not that you don't believe God. You just don't have a childlike faith. And I want to give you an illustration to think about. When the boys were really little, we went to the Lovington Fair, okay, the Lee County Fair and Pro Rodeo, and there's those certain nights that are busier than other nights, the nights when everybody's trying to buy a raffle ticket for a shotgun, 
the nights when everybody's trying to uh, get the best, most cotton candy, the nights when everybody's trying to get the water gauge or the, the uh, popcorn, you know. The boys were really little. Hudson was, was especially little. And I just simply turned to him and I saw the crowd. And I said, hold my hand. And without any question, Hudson reaches up and grabs my hand. And we walked through the, the, uh, the popcorn eaters. And we walked through the raffle buyers. And we walked through the Haas Boys and Girls Club car people. And we walked through the, uh, Lee, County Pro, the Lee County Hall of Fame raffle tickets. They always want your money. Why do you people always want our money? And, and, you, 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 and the whole time, Hudson never got lost. He never got confused. He never got stolen. He never had to go find somebody he knew to get him back to the path. You know why through all of the distractions and all of the people, you know why Hudson stayed on course? Because he had his daddy's hand. And let me tell you one of the coolest prayers you can ever pray, macho man, tough guy, is when you stop and say, Daddy, will you please let me hold your hand today? Daddy, will you please let me hold your hand? Will you lead me? Father, would you lead me? Would you lead me away from temptation? There's a lot of things that want to confuse me. There's a lot of things that want to pull my attention. There's a lot of things going on right now, but I want to keep my focus on you. And you, you may do this in your truck. You may do this in your office. You may do this in church. You may do this during this praise and worship time here in a minute. But somebody in this room needs to think about being a kid again. That you're not older than God. You're not bigger than God. And maybe during this worship time, at some point, you just need to do this. this. And, and, and you're, the people next to you are going to go, oh, wow. And don't just, they're, just, they're a distraction. They're, they're a temptation. Ignore them, okay? And this is you <coughs> being led not to temptation, but to hold on to your daddy's hand, to be willing to go wherever he wants to go. Lead me from temptation. And Lord, deliver me from evil. There are things that God sees that you can't see. There are things that God knows that you don't know. So take his hand and let him lead you. And for, for some of you control freaks in the room, it's going to be the scariest, most dangerous prayer you ever prayed. But you're going to find that your heart's been wanting this for a long time now. To let go and let God. And the very last thing for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, leave that up there. For yours is the kingdom. The kingdom of God is what we do. It's the power. When we do the kingdom, sometimes we're going to find out that we run out of ideas. We run out of power. We run out of ability. I'm only human. But Jesus says, pray this way. May your kingdom come. And Father, may your power come as well. And this is what we call how we do what we do. But the last part says, and yours is the glory forever and ever. And this is whom we do it for. What we do, how we do, and who we do it for. This has stretched me over the years. And so if you would, would you stand to your feet? Everybody stand up. We're going we're gonna to sing a worship song. If you're at home, we want to encourage you. Come on, you, you, sing with us. And right now, just everybody just bow your head. Everybody bow your head. You may have never been to church before. That's okay. I am so glad you're here. This isn't about church. This isn't about me. But when was the last time you just stopped and thought about letting God be God and be your father? Not maybe the negative idea of what a father. I'm talking about that good father who turns to you and says, I protect you. 
I love you. I provide for you. I show you. You're adopted in the family. You see all this? It's all yours because I'm your dad. It, it could be your prayer. My Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Father, give me this day my daily bread. Everything I need, you know my needs. You know my needs. But you also know my diet needs, my, my, my spiritual needs. Lord, speak to me about the specific things that I need in my life, in my marriage, and raising kids. Who I am. Lord, forgive me my sins. The ones I know about and the ones I don't know about. As I also forgive those who've sinned against me. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.